Somebody asked me how long is going to be this speech. I don't know really why the question, but I said our next appointment is 6.30. <laughs> so I think I can fill the space between. It's a great honor to be here, and I appreciate the invitation to share a few things with you. It's always a pleasure to be here, and uh, when Denver calls me for uh, uh, coming to speak at chapel or any occasion that is needed, to me it's always a great honor and pleasure because uh, I think that uh, maybe I can help people to count blessings. This is a great blessing. Uh, in all my years in uh, service to God in Italy, I always dreamed to be part of an occasion like this. I always dreamed to have a preaching school nearby where you can have, uh, what is 10, 12 uh, students uh, that uh, are faithfully studying, have uh, so many servants of God that are there all together so close that you can depend on but also you can receive the great teachings that we receive during this week. To me this week has been a, a, a beautiful mine in that I was able to collect the gems and the precious things that will help me to go through my daily life. And I'm grateful not only to the school, not only to Denver and Jeff, not only to the committee that organized the lecture, I'm really thankful to all the speakers that uh, have been here before me. Now, somebody also asked, asked me how I was feeling. And I have to admit that I feel very intimidated, intimidated because of what I just said. I am uh, almost the last of a long list of great preachers. Frank is going to close, so I am tranquil because whatever mess I'm going to do now, he's going to catch it and make it better before the end of the meeting. Now, how many of you are tired? You can be honest. How many of you like roller coasters? Oh, I was expecting more people. <laughs> well, I know that you are tired, but we are going to go on a roller coaster right now. So you please uh, sit very carefully. I will not ask you to stand and do you, you, all those things. I, you don't need to do it, but you please pay close attention to what is going to happen. If you are like me, I like roller coasters, but I, I like just to watch people. Not because I uh, am afraid of the ride, or not because uh, I don't like the ride, but just because my stomach doesn't hold the ride. Most of the times, uh, if I'm riding in a car with somebody else, I get sick. And uh, my stomach, evidently, is very sensible to motion and rolling. But uh, I like to uh, take my son and uh, his friends or take the kids from the church to uh, places like Kennywood or other places like that and, and just spend the day watching them on this roller coaster. Well, we are starting in this uh, uh, next uh, 40 minutes deals with uh, a very impressive ride on an emotional roller coaster. We're going to see three people that are going to be in those little cars, and they're going to be shake here and there. They're going to swing around, and they're going to uh, think that they go from a very high height to very low depth. The conversion of uh, the jailer of Philippi, I really think, 
is the account of uh, the unexpected, unthinkable roller coaster ride from Paul, Silas, and the jailer. But let's start from the beginning. I don't know if you have seen this in your life, but things don't go always the way that we want. I could say that most of the time, things don't go the way that I would like to see going. Paul wanted to go to preach in Asia and in Bithynia. And he was making all his plans to go there. He had good intentions. He wanted to share the gospel with the people there. And we know from other scriptures that he had the aim to go and preach in places that nobody else already touched. Nobody else already went there. And so he was really eager to go to those places. But the Holy Spirit forbids that. One night, the apostle has a vision. A man from Macedonia is pleading him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul understands that this is a vision from God. And uh, here begins his ride on the roller coaster. For how much he was planning to go to Asia, for how much he already had in his mind all the cities and all the places that he was going to visit, he has to change plans. God calls him to change plans. I wonder. I wonder if Paul really ever stop and say, wait, wait, wait a moment, God. What I want to do, you know, is nothing different than what you want me to do. I want to go to preach. And you want me to go to Macedonia. I want to go to Asia. So you know what we can do, God? I'll go through Asia and Bithynia, and then I will reach Macedonia. What do you, what do you think about that deal? That, that sound familiar to you? Is it that... Something that sometimes we do uh, in things. God says, uh, if your brother sin against you, you go and talk to him. If you have something against your brother, your sister, you go and deal directly with them. Don't we go and say, yeah, we'll do that. But before that, let me go to the preacher. Before that, let me go to my best friend. Before that, let me go to 1,051 other people. And then I'll get there. No. Scripture says, immediately, Paul looked for a way to reach Macedonia. Immediately. Acts chapter 16, from verse 6 to verse 10. He didn't wait. He didn't stop there and say, wait, let, let, let me reconcile. Let me reconcile the whole thing. Let me, let me put together my will and God's will. No, he just stops everything. He said, whatever I plan, I don't care. God calls me to Macedonia. And I'll try to find the best way to get there. He doesn't look for other ways. Along with his companions, he sails from Troas to Samothrace first and Neapolis the following days, and then finally he arrives to the Roman colony called Philippi. History informs, my, informs us about the great importance of that city. Philippi was a major strategic place. I'll let you uh, read in the book whenever you have more time all the historical facts about the name and about how uh, the whole thing uh, came up. But I would like to spend a few minutes with you about what was a Roman colony. 
because uh, unless you really like history, probably you never heard that Roman colonies were special places, were places where the people that were citizens of that city were enjoying three major rights that nobody else had except in Rome, except in Rome. Rome was the capital. Rome was where the emperor was. Rome was uh, where the Senate was. Rome was the center of the world. In Italy, we have a saying that is, tutte le strade portano a Roma. All roads brings to Rome. Rome was the center of everything. So if you were a Roman colony, you were a little Rome wherever you were. And here Philippi was very distant from Rome, but was highly important because was enjoying libertas, or self-government, self immunitas, or freedom from paying the taxes to the emperor, and use italicus, that is the right to live like a Roman, to live, to dress, to talk, to have the coins, to celebrate the holidays, and to be treated as a Roman citizen. If you were not in the colony, you had not those rights. That's why Philippi was uh, uh, so important, and that's why Philippi was uh, a city that uh, drew the attention of Paul. When the dream, uh, when the vision came to him, was come to Macedonia. Paul targeted directly to Philippi. That was the center. And Paul searches as soon as he gets there. He searches for godly people to associate and uh, to teach them about uh, Jesus Christ. Of course, there was no church there. Of course, there were no Christians there. And from what we can read in Acts chapter 16, there was not even a synagogue. Because if there was a synagogue, that's the place where Paul was going to go. Instead, he is uh, beginning to ask, and he gets the information that down at the river, there was a place where on the Sabbath day, some women were custom to gather to pray. One of these uh, ladies was converted along with all of her household. Let me make a small parenthesis here. If you were not here yesterday at this hour, I really encourage you not only to get the book so that you can have all the speeches, but especially to get uh, the recording. Brother Steve Stevens has done uh, all the introduction to what we are going to see now. And he had a very excellent uh, lesson on Lydia and on uh, the things that were around that conversion. Because this is what we are doing today. We are keep on looking what's around the conversion of the jailer. So uh, if you have that possibility, do it. Back to the lesson. Following the conversion, Lydia is uh, very, uh, very uh, proactive. She invites Paul and uh, uh, his companions to spend uh, time in their home, and she is going to take care of them. Paul, of course, is there with the mission to preach, and he keeps on preaching. And as he preaches, he keeps on walking through the city. This city evidently was uh, pretty big. And Paul was spending time trying to find more people to teach. One day, he meets a girl, a slave. 
a slave that was possessed by a spirit of divination, Acts 16, 16. And this is the girl started to follow Paul and his companions, and every day, wherever they were going, she was screaming and she was shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaims to us the way of salvation. Paul finds a herald, somebody that is proclaiming why he is there. Maybe we would be happy, but Paul is not. Paul is not happy at all. Paul doesn't need a demon or a person that is subject to a demon to teach and to proclaim godly truth. This slave was a slave in a double sense, by being uh, under masters and by being under a demon. Even Jesus did not accept the testimony of demons. Mark chapter 1, verse 23 to 26. So here, we have the Apostle Paul, let's try to make a little the point of the situation, that uh, had to give up his dream to go to Asia. He goes through Philippi. Yes, he finds some uh, ladies that uh, were converted, so he was rejoicing. He said, that, that's good, that's good. But as he continued to preach, now he has this nagging, screaming girl that he is uh, follow continuously, and he doesn't care for her to continue to do that. So he stops the thing. In the name of Jesus Christ, he commands the evil spirit to come out of her. Did he thought about what was going to happen? Did he thought about that now the roller coaster that was high up there is going to draw down very, very fast? The masters of this slave when they saw that there was no more the opportunity to make money out of her, they want revenge. They don't go to Paul and ask money. They want just to be vindicated, and so they go to the magistrates. Remember, this is a Roman colony. The magistrates just <laughs> take Paul and Silas command that they are punished severely and thrown into jail. Not just into jail, but uh, to kept securely. <laughs> okay, Paul cancels his dream, goes to Philippi, converts Lydia, the screaming girl, miracle, the masters get on him. Now he is in prison. Let's be honest. At this very point, when the roller coaster is all the way down, who do you say, God, why me? I had good intentions. I didn't ask to come here. Why me? When you asked me to come to Macedonia, have you thought about that, God? Also because, you know, in antiquity, prisons were not like our prisons. Our prisons are full of uh, comfort, are full of uh, nice fac facilities, you have air conditioning, you have television, you have radio, you can play with the computer, you can uh, uh, go through the internet as much as you want. If you want to work, yeah, you can work some, but you have good meals, and if the meals is not that good enough, you can complain, because probably there will be also a union for those that are in prison sooner or later. But the point is that that time, prisons were not for long-term detention. Prisons at that time were just places where people were put there until 
those who were in command were choosing what to do with them. If you were getting in prison, if you didn't have the money to pay somebody to open the door and let you sneak out and run for your life, you knew that within a few days, your life was over. In the book, you find a, a description of what was a, re a Roman prison. There is a lot of fantasy. I heard uh, <laughs> some people thinking about prisons in, in such a funny way. But the prison at that time was a nasty, ugly place, especially when you were considered to be a dangerous prisoner, like Paul and Silas were supposed to be. Because usually you were in chain at your wrist, and those chains were never being taken off. You know, it was not the problem. A couple of days, max a week, you were going to be dying, so who cares? But the real dangers, they were tied on their uh, feet in the wall. And they were in a small room with no windows. And when the door was shutting, air was shutting off, light. And you don't know what was, you don't want to know what was in those cells. Do I need to keep on repeating the, the, from uh, the beginning? You know, Paul, I want to go to Asia. No, you go to Macedonia. Da, 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 da. Now, he is in prison. He knows that uh, if he, those masters have their way, he and Silas, 24, 48 hours, they will die. He's not afraid of dying. He knows that his Lord has prepared the place for him. So he's not concerned about that. But humanly speaking, would you be a little discouraged? A little depressed? Again, not because you are afraid of dying. You know that you're going to go in a better place. But boy, if I just went to Asia, how different would it have been? And the roller coaster changed direction. Unexpectedly, around midnight, somebody asked, why about midnight? Why not before that? Why not before that? Well, after you have been beaten, after you have been kicked here and there, your body is all hurting and sorry. I believe it took them a little while to get adjusted to the new situation. But when they got a little more comfortable in their pains, they start singing at midnight. I have a very strange dog. I have two dogs. They both are strange, but one more than the other one. And I disclaim that because that's not my dog, that's my son's dog. But he left for college and he left his dog to me. This dog is a beautiful dog, but it's so weird. I, they sleep downstairs in the basement. And of course, before I go to bed, I let them out, run a little bit, drink, whatever. They go back in the cage, and they like to sleep in the cage. We have two cages. No, they want to sleep in the same cage. So here you have those two dogs. They stay in this little cage. They like it. Okay, you can stay there. But this dog, Kia, for some strange reason, around 1, 2 o'clock in the night, every so often started barking. My wife doesn't hear anything. I hear a fly. So what happened? I don't want to get up. So from my bed, I said, basta! Shut up. Stop it. <laughs> the dog hears that and quits. That's not too bad. It took me training. I had to go down a couple of times, but she learned. Can you imagine this? We are in a prison. 
two of the most dangerous prisoners at midnight, they start singing. The other prisoners, I don't think they were that happy. I don't think they were so pleased. They knew that death was coming, and maybe the next morning was death for some of them, and they were singing. You think some of them maybe uh, screamed to Paul and Silas to shut up, stop singing? Can you think of something different? You know, you have no reason to sing. You're going to die. The jailer is sleeping. The jailer is sleeping. He is totally ignorant that he is sleeping in a car on the roller coaster. That for a while it's been stopped there, but now it's starting to move. Now, start shaking, a earthquake arrives. You know, he was sleeping, but God is not sleeping. The prisoner might be bothered by Paul and Silas to sing, but God is only pleased because of their faith and because of their trust. So from heaven, he decides, I'll do something there. And here started the roller coaster for the jailer. By the way, Luke chapter 22 from verse 39 to verse, to verse 46. We have a similar situation. A man was in agony. A man was praying to his father, if it is possible, let this cup pass over. A man was going to face death. And he was not concerned about his physical death. He was concerned about the sins of all humanity on his shoulders. And he asked his friends, stay here and pray with me. But they sleep. For three times, he finds them sleeping. And they miss the angel that comes down and comfort the master. The jailer is sleeping until everything shakes. And he understands what's happening. And so he is a soldier. He was a Roman soldier. He was not a wimp. He was not a weak person. He was not a, uh, able to react. He was a Roman soldier, the conquerors of the empire. And if he was in Philippi, very likely he has been receiving a prize from the emperor. Usually, the colonies were, uh, were mainly ruled in, uh, in, uh, ab uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, people from uh, the army. Uh, soldiers that have been very faithful as a pay after big battles were receiving pieces of land. The jailer, he was a Roman, and he received very likely that property from the, from the emperor. So he knows that uh, something strange happened. He looks around and he finds the doors of the jails open. Prisons were not uh, the same at that time than today. And being a jailer is not the same today as was at that time. At that time, the jailer was paying for his own li with, with his own life the security of the prisoners. You know, I don't get it. This prisoner were going to die pretty soon. So who cares if they don't get to the magistrates? An earthquake, they can't, you know, no, you are the jailer, you are going to be responsible. He looks around, it's just take a moment to understand they are gone. You know, the doors are open, either they are dead under the, 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 the thing that can have been fallen in, or they escape. And so he tries to kill himself. And at that moment, the voice of one of them says, do no harm to yourself. We are all here. It's interesting that uh, the jailer just uh, jump in and uh, probably ask for a light to make sure that everybody's there. And he makes quickly the count. And he understands everything in that moment. He understands 
that those people that were in jail were not supposed to be in jail. He understand that they were not the real prisoners, but he was the real prisoners. And he understand that he has to do something. He is a soldier. He is a man of action, a man of quick decisions. And so he goes and uh, asks the most important question ever. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? We don't have the time to go through all the possible interpretation of this question. You have it in the book. But for sure, as Paul and Silas replied to this man, they understand that he understands that this salvation is not from human beings, but is from God. He knows that these people are sent from God. How he knows? Many different ways. Maybe the screaming girl is the one that informed him. Maybe they, when, uh, when they brought Paul and Silas into prison, they told them, you know, these are fanatics. These think that they come from God. They have a special message. But he understands. All this is divine. These two people are not supposed to be here. So as a man of decision, as a man of action, he makes the decision to pull them out of the jail. Another emotional decision that could cost him the life. Who gave him the right to pull them out of the jail? He should have shut off the door, shut, shut down, the, uh, shut, closed the door. He should have put uh, more chains on them. But that's not what happened. He takes them up there and he makes sure that they understand that he wants to know what is needed to be baptized. He is going to receive the preaching of the gospel. And uh, in verse 33 of Acts 16, we have one more time the word immediately. As Paul immediately left his plan from Asia to go to Macedonia, this man immediately, he and his family was baptized. Immediately. Didn't wait. Didn't say, let me call my friends. Let's wait on Sunday. You know, Sunday is better. No, immediately. His question, what I need to be doing, what must I do to be saved? It was so sincere that he waited no time at all. But before being immersed, there is a small detail in verse 33 that uh, is highly significant. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed he, their stripes. Remember, this man was a soldier. And being a soldier today is a rough, difficult thing. At that time, it was even worse. This man, I don't expect this man to have a lot of emotion. This man didn't care about blood. He didn't care about stripes until he understands that the God in heaven is using these prisoners to bring him to understanding. So from that a car in the roller coaster, when he walked up and he went all the way down and he almost killed himself, right now he is changing. He is doing something inside himself, up in something, something that changed everything. Matthew chapter 3, verse 8. Repentance that Jesus prayed for, that Jesus commanded. The jailer was really convinced of the message of salvation. And true repentance made the change of his mind, made the change of his life. And he took care of the material needs of those two men. In the end, both for Paul and Silas, 
and for the jailer, the account ends. Verse 34, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. What a roller coaster of emotion is involved in the conversion of the soul. Let's make sure, brothers and sisters, that we never give from, for granted that a conversion is an intellectual thing. Sometimes we are so good in proclaiming the points and the steps of the plan of salvation, but are we paying attention to the soul, to the emotions that are involved? It is so easy to say to someone, repent, or you go to hell. But are we really paying attention to what is the heart of that person in that moment? Are we paying attention where is their car in the roller coaster? If his eye up there or his law down there? Are we compassionate? in our process of bringing souls to Christ? The jailer in Philippi teach us all these things. And today, if you are here and you need to make things right with God, I hope that you can feel that we care about all these things. The message of salvation is not just a, a, a formal action. It is a heart-changing process. If you need to repent from your sins, if you need to make things right with God, if you need to admit that you need a savior, if you need to find the joy that comes from the knowledge that your sins have been washed away through the waters of baptism because of the blood of Jesus Christ. If you need to have the joy to know that you can live the rest of your life not anymore under the guilt of sin, but being faithful to God. Your car in the roller coaster of the emotions might be in different places. But Jesus wants us to share that with you. If you are a Christian, but you are not being faithful, and you are risking to be thrown out of that roller coaster, you know, you know how much Jesus cares for you and people here cares for you also. If you need to make things right with God, do it now as together we stand and sing.